Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Christopher Borge, and I'm a freshman of the college studying government and a member of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, both on the park side and the JFK street side. In the event of an emergency, please exit the door nearest to you and congregate in JFK Jr. Park. Now, please take a moment to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Lombard Director, Lombard Director of the Shorenstein Center and Edward R. Murrow, Professor of Practice of Press, Politics, and Public Policy, Nancy Gibbs. Good evening everyone and welcome to the 31st celebration of the Goldsmith Prize for Investigative Reporting in the Public Interest. This is a feast year for democracy when more people in more countries are going to go to the polls than ever before in history. And so we get to celebrate the journalists who build the foundation for that freedom. Tonight's honorees prove the power of effective journalism, the kind that empowers people, as the mission of this school reminds us, to live freer, safer, healthier lives. They are masters of investigation, maestros of data. They are explorers and explainers and entrepreneurs and inexhaustibly curious and a reminder of why we should see their work as a form of public service. We also honor the author of two books whose work has illuminated the intersection of press and politics and public policy, and we get to celebrate the work of an iconic journalist who has shaped our understanding of our country, our discourse, our essential institutions. I should note that we recognize all of this work at a time when Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich marks one year in a Russian jail, when the free press worldwide is challenged by autocrats determined to crush it and technologies designed to bury it, and opportunists who view outrage as a business model and a business model that no one has quite been able to figure out. So tonight is both celebration and wake up call. The Goldsmith Awards were founded in 1991 thanks to the vision and the generosity of the Greenfield family whose foundation has supported it ever since. And I'm so glad that Greenfield Foundation trustees uh, Jill greenfield Fellman, Joan and Bill Greenfield, Bill Epstein, and Mike Greenfield, our faithful judge, are all able to be here with us. We'll start the evening with the Goldsmith Book Prize, which my colleague Tom Patterson, the Bradley Professor of Government and the Press, will present. Nancy, thank you. Uh, two Goldsmith Book Prizes are awarded uh, each year, one for the best recent academic book and one for the best recent trade book in the field of media, politics, and public policy. As chosen by the selection committee, which this year consisted of Matt Baum, Jeff Seglin, and myself, the academic winner is Repression in the Digital Age, Surveillance, Censorship, and the dynamic of state violence. Now, when the internet was open to the public in the 1990s, I was among those who thought it would usher in an era of unprecedented civic engagement. That's happened to a degree, but there's been a lot of bad stuff too, including a rise in misinformation and hate speech. But nowhere is the danger greater than in authoritarian regimes which have weaponized digital technology. That's the subject of this year's award-winning academic book. As it spells out, autocratic regimes, when faced with a political threat, can block or restrict online access, 
or expand it to allow state agents to more easily track and target regime opponents or shut down parts of the internet to suppress information about extreme acts of state violence. These are not mere possibilities. They are based on what autocratic regimes are now doing. The book's findings are based on data from the Syrian conflict, case evidence from Iran, and the first global comparative analysis of the relationship between internet outages and state repression. The author of Repression in the Digital Age is Anita Godas, a professor of international relations and cybersecurity at the Hertie School in Berlin. Anita came in from Germany to join us this evening. Anita, please come up to receive the Goldsmith Academic Book Award for Repression in the Digital Age. Thank you so much to the committee, and what an honor to be here and receive this, um, this award. Um, this is the culmination of more than a decade of work. Um, much of it started here as a postdoc at the Kennedy School at the Belfast Center, so it's really wonderful to be back, and thank you so much for, for the honor. Now, as I indicated, uh, there's also a goldsmith uh, Book Prize for the best trade book in the field of press and politics. So what happens when misinformation settles into our brains? Well, like red wine on a rug, it's likely to stay put. We're now more than three years out <clears throat> from the 2020 presidential election, and despite dozens of court rulings and lengthy congressional hearings to the contrary, two-thirds of Republicans continue to believe the election was stolen. Our trade book winner, Foolproof, Why Misinformation Infects Our Minds and How to Build Immunity, <clears throat> tells us why our false beliefs are hard to root out. It also shows why we have a bigger appetite, whether they're true or not, for messages that align with what we'd like to believe. Combine these age-old psychological tendencies with social media, talk media, partisan media, and deceptive political leaders, and you end up with a misinformation pandemic that, unlike COVID, gets worse by the year. And it's costly. It fuels polarization and sows distrust. So what will protect us from misinformation? Well, we can ask the platforms to take down misinformation before it invades our minds, but the platform's goals don't align with ours. They make money by attracting and holding our attention, and because false facts are often more riveting than real ones, we're drawn to them and tend to share them. That's good for the platforms, bad for our minds. That's where our trade book winner comes to our rescue. It's the definitive guide on how people can navigate digital space. It offers a set of practical tools that can inoculate us against misinformation, including debunking or pre-bunking, measured exposure to a false claim before its full cascade overwhelms us. The author of Foolproof is Sander van der Linden, a social psychology professor at the University of Cambridge in the UK. Sander was unable to travel here for the Goldsmith Book Award, but is with us on screen. So, Sander, it must be midnight there or so, right? <laughs> it, is, it is almost midnight here, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, for a fantastic um, summary, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I, I, I wanted to, uh, to, to at least be there um, virtually. Um, it's a real honor to, uh, to receive this uh, award. You know, I see misinformation as one of the defining challenges of our time, um, being involved in the escalation of wars, undermining public health, um, sowing distrust in elections, um, you, you name it. So I wrote this book to try to empower us all to better understand and fight misinformation, um, and given the you know the war on truth and science that's ongoing, 
um, I, I see it as a testament more generally to the importance of, uh, of this issue. So again, I'm super grateful um, and um, thanks very much for, uh, for honoring me with, uh, with the award. Yeah. <clears throat> And thank you, Sander. It's a wonderful book and uh, for staying up late. So, Nancy, it's all yours. This year's judges for the Investigative Reporting Prize reviewed about 170 nominations and did the harrowing work of narrowing that down to our six finalists. So, judges, please stand if you are here tonight. Betsy Fisher-Martin, Mike Greenfield, Corey Johnson, Barbara Laker, Philip Martin, Carmen Noble, Ayushi Roy, Marilou Sutters, and Bina Venkatraman. Thank you. <laughs> the six finalists for this prize excel at both the art and the craft of telling stories that matter. To read about their detective work, they are endless FOIA requests and data analysis, the meticulous assembling of claims and clues and evidence is a reminder of why this kind of reporting is essential to the health of our communities. The finalists are Hannah Dreyer of the New York Times for Alone and Exploited. Marcos Cooks was 14 years old when he had his arm ripped open at a Purdue slaughterhouse. This series uncovered a hidden workforce of migrant children all across the country. We found thousands of children working in all 50 states. Many were catastrophically injured at work and some died. What I learned is that the explosion of migrant child labor over the past few years is really the result of a chain of willful ignorance. I found government failures at every level from the federal agencies that were supposed to care for these children, to the inspectors who were supposed to punish their employers, to the schools that looked the other way. Hannah's investigation was so powerful that response was swift and immediate. It led to massive overhauls of federal agencies and changes in state laws. Next is Casey Ross and Bob Herman of STAT for Denied by AI, how big insurers use algorithms to cut off care for Medicaid Advantage patients. These patients had paid into Medicare all their lives and an algorithm that they don't even know exists is used to cut off their care. Our series of stories uncovered a massive profit-driven campaign led by the nation's largest health insurance company to cut off care for seniors with very serious illnesses and injuries. These denials often came prematurely and they left patients and their families facing an impossible choice. Either they could drain their life savings to pay for care or they could simply go without it. They had no ability to question its conclusions, no ability to fight back, and no one was watching. The story is impactful because while the headline calls out AI, the real culprit was the company's rigid adherence to predictive algorithms and the misuse of mathematical scores to determine healthcare coverage decisions. Justin Elliott, Joshua Kaplan, Brett Murphy, Alex Majerjeski, Kirsten Berg, and the ProPublica staff for Friends of the Court.
What surprised me most was the scale of what we found. Decades of secret gifts from international vacations to private school tuition payments. Our story is focused on questions of ethics and influence the U.S. Supreme Court. At least two justices have accepted luxury gifts from billionaire political donors, and they did not disclose those gifts to the public as required by federal law. Clarence Thomas in particular has accepted a flood of secret gifts over the past 25 years that has no known precedent. What impressed me the most was the sheer detective work involved in this story. The team at ProPublica exposed the most serious ethical scandal in the modern history of the U.S. Supreme Court. Next up is Jesse Coburn of Streets Blog for Ghost Tags, Inside New York City's Black Market for Temporary License Plates. What surprised me most was how easy it was to carry out this scam. There were few guardrails to prevent used car dealers from selling large numbers of fraudulent tags. My reporting focused on an underground economy for temporary license plates that flourished in New York City during the COVID-19 pandemic. What I learned is that New Yorkers were opening used car dealerships in states with loose regulations, gaining access to government systems for printing temporary plates, and then selling vast numbers of them illegally in New York City. Their buyers were dangerous drivers using the fraudulent tags to drive on suspended licenses, to evade tolls and traffic tickets, and to commit more serious crimes on the road with their identities concealed. This was investigative reporting at its best. This series did what officials frankly failed to do, to address the out of control problem of ghost tags and their consequences. Next, we have Elissa Daly, Brian Howie, Nate Rosenfield, and Jerry Mitchell of Mississippi Today and the New York Times for Unfettered Power, Mississippi Sheriffs. Despite these allegations of abuse being so widespread in Mississippi, most of them have slipped through the cracks. Our reporting focused on the unfettered power of Mississippi sheriffs, who rule like kings and typically face little press or prosecutorial scrutiny. This series revealed how sheriffs and their deputies have dodged accountability after being accused of sex abuse, extreme violence, and other corruption. Powerful officials in the criminal justice system had repeatedly failed to investigate or prosecute after learning of the allegations. The coverage revealed a succession of outrageous abuses. It drove home the power of listening to people on the margins of society. For it is often those folk who contain the most important secrets and the most important stories for all of us. And finally, Michael D. Sala, Debbie Zenzipper, Michael Korsh, Evan Robinson Johnson, Monica Sager, and Margaret Fleming of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and ProPublica and the Medill Investigative Lab at Northwestern University for, with every breath, millions of breathing machines, one dangerous defect. The sense of urgency was beyond any other project we had ever worked on. People were literally dying on us. Our reporting focused on Philips Respironics, an online medical device company in Pittsburgh. The company had found that foam fitted inside its sleep apnea devices and ventilators was breaking down and emitting volatile organic compounds. 
Thousands of complaints had bombarded the company over a decade, and yet they were never turned over to the Food and Drug Administration. It was a corporate cover-up, the likes of which we had never seen. This story was devastating. In addition to revealing what the company knew and when, and for how long, the reporters also told personal stories of individuals who felt betrayed after realizing they had been breathing toxic fumes from machines that were supposed to help them breathe. I expect you can sympathize with the challenge that our judges faced. Um, and I want to congratulate again all of our finalists. And it is a great pleasure to announce the winner is Hannah Dreyer of the New York Times. Hannah, unfortunately, um, couldn't be here tonight for the excellent reason that she gave birth to her first child a few weeks ago. <laughs> but we know that she is watching at home, and so I hope that that means that she is going to be able to greet us nonetheless. Yay! <laughs> Great. Can you see me? Can you hear us? Because we, it's, or is your sound on? There you go. Okay, I can hear you. Congratulations. Oh, uh, thank you so much. So I'm home with a new baby. Um, <laughs> we can see. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to the Shorenstein Center and the Kennedy School. Um, it's such an honor to be in the company of these other finalists who really have done some of the best journalism I've ever seen. Um, and thank you to my brilliant editors, Lainey Shapiro, who pulled so many late nights, and Kirsten Danis, who showed amazing grace under pressure when some of the world's biggest corporations started calling to get their names taken out of the stories. And I just want to accept this amazing honor on behalf of the children who took huge risks in speaking out. These were 14 15 year olds who had their arms shredded by industrial machines who were waking up at the crack of dawn to work on roofs. And they had nothing to gain um, from sharing their experiences except the hope of helping other people, which um, they really did in the end. So thank you. I hope everybody has a great night. That counts as the happiest reason ever not to get to be here in person. Um, this year, for the first time, we are also presenting a new prize, the Goldsmith Special Citation for Reporting on Government. We chose um, our winners from the same nominees for the Investigative Reporting Prize. And the citation is open for, to both investigative and explanatory work that really shines a light on how government works. They do the heroic and often unheralded work of explaining how the very deep into the procedural weeds, the decisions that are, are made that have an enormous effect on individual lives. The reality of governing is messy, and policymaking is often measured in wins and losses in legislatures or at the ballot box, rather than where it's made real in the day-to-day -day lives of the people affected, or in the functioning of huge agencies, in the interplay of policy and procedure and systems, and millions of civil servants going about their work. In unearthing a significant problem in the Social Security Administration, the winners of this inaugural Goldsmith Special Citation for Reporting on Government achieved two things. They honored the work of people whose lives were dramatically affected, and they found the structural weaknesses 
that caused this to happen, including chronic underfunding of the agency and outdated, incomplete data systems, the understanding that makes reform possible. They did this all in a collaboration that paired a national nonprofit newsroom with dozens of local TV stations around the country, connecting the dots from the most local impacts to the highest level of government. The winner of the Goldsmith Special Citation for Reporting on Government is Overpayment Outrage by Jody Fleischer, David Hilsenrath, and the teams at KFF Health News and the Cox Media Group. The federal agency that assigns a unique identifying number to every American told us it had no way to know how many people were being hit with overpayments. Our reporting exposed how the Social Security Administration was routinely overpaying between six and seven billion dollars a year to people around the country, and then clawing that money back, even when it was the government's mistake. We found a catastrophic breakdown of a federal safety net on which millions of the nation's most vulnerable people depend. These clawbacks target the poorest of the poor, the elderly, and the disabled. People already struggling to get by on modest monthly benefits. This coverage revealed that two million people a year are affected by these overpayments. What impressed me most was the story's depiction of the impact of seemingly arcane policies on the lives of regular people. The SSA getting it right the first time is incredibly important, and these stories underscored what can happen when they get it wrong. Jody and David, join us. And... Ah, congratulations. congratulations. Congrats. Thank you to the judges, the Shorenstein Center, and the Kennedy School. Hope this is adjusted for my height. Uh, it is a privilege to be here among such inspiring colleagues and um, representing such an outstanding team. It's also a privilege to be part of an organization, KFF Health News, that is so dedicated to journalism in the public interest as a public service. We share this honor with the people who trusted us to tell their stories, people like Addie and Justina and Dave and Denise, and we hope that by recognizing their struggles, this award puts wind in the sails of people in and out of government who are trying to fix this badly broken system. Jody? Thanks. We are incredibly honored to be included among this elite group of journalists. And I am especially proud to win this award with this team, uh, a team a collaboration that embraced the power of local news to have national impact and journalism that triggered change for millions of people. Um, I am truly proud of how our eight local TV stations worked together to tell stories that really mattered to their community and mattered to the nation, that caught the attention of lawmakers in Washington and really made a difference. It's why we do what we do. And so, the Goldsmith Career Award lets us meet and celebrate our heroes. Daughter of a Holocaust survivor, Nina Totenberg began her career in Boston, traveled through the corridors of power in Washington, earned her place on J. Edgar Hoover's enemies list, and probably that of the lawmakers featured in her story on the 10 dumbest members of Congress. She's often called a founding mother of NPR and was one of those who helped build it into a national treasure. It is also hard to overstate the debt that journalists who followed her, myself included, owe to her and the smart, tough women who put up with 
an amazing amount of nonsense as they blaze the trail for the rest of us. Whether Watergate or Iran-Contra or William Ginsburg's pot use or the revelatory reporting about the allegations leveled by Anita Hill against Clarence Thomas, Nina was the person people talked to, leaped to, which speaks to the trust she earned and the truth she pursued. Hers is that shrewd and savvy voice in our ears that's in, that invites us to travel with her through these strange legal swamps and know that we will be okay, we are well and wisely led. It's remarkable, not just the sheer number of awards that she has won, but their source and nature. Uh, Nina wins prizes that seldom or ever go to broadcast or radio reporters, honors from those who know what great reporting on hard topics looks like, such as more than half a dozen awards from the American Bar Association or the American Judicature, can't say that, society's first ever award honoring a career body of work in the field of journalism and the law. She has more than two dozen honorary degrees, which suggests she is also the master of the commencement address, and so we are lucky to get to learn from her tonight. We have much to discuss, Nina, but first some insight into our career award winner from another familiar voice. While there were large, cacophonous crowds outside, inside the Supreme Court chamber, the tone was somber, respectful, and to some extent, clear. Nina did not become formidable by being famous. Nina became famous by being formidable, and she was formidable from day one. Early in her career, she was often the only woman in the room and standing up for herself, for this small news organization, NPR, that many people hadn't heard of. She is a harder worker than most people I've ever met. And she tells stories with such insight and animation that keeps you engaged as a listener. When she asked a follow-up question, when she jumped in, when she pushed back, those were early lessons in my journalism career, and they're lessons that I still use today. Congratulations, Nina. This honor is so well-deserved, and I'm happy to help you celebrate it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Goldsmith Career Award winner, Nina Totenberg. skiing, but I did not. It's the, I'm the victim of a terrible back and great surgery that, without which I probably wouldn't be walking today, but it's a bit of a haul. Well, you are, all of you, may I say, are heroic to turn out in a classic Boston monsoon, um, <laughs> and you especially. Um, so thank you, and I'm, and I'm, there are so many places I could start, and I'm tempted to just travel through your illustrious career, but old reflex, I have to start with the news on a day that Justice Breyer has a op-ed in the New York Times talking about the court and the friendships and how everyone got along so well, and I couldn't help but wonder what it would be like given all you knew and saw of those relationships among the justices through the years about. So Steve and Joanna Breyer live just blocks from here. And I interviewed him this week at the Smithsonian. And in fact, the book that he's written is fairly direct and critical. But he's not capable of doing that in a public way. 
And I gave him a very hard time at the Smithsonian. Um, I, at one point, had to say to him, Justice Breyer, I've asked you this question three times, and you still haven't answered it, and it's still on the exam. <laughs> but I still didn't get an answer. And the truth is that he is still so loyal to the court and what it stands for uh, that I think it's just very, and these are his friends. His, you know, for good or ill, when, you're, when you serve on the Supreme Court, the joke is that it's a, a dysfunctional marriage with no option of divorce. Um, and you have to get along. And he was the best at forging friendships and making people get along and making them sometimes come to some compromises. Um, and I don't know why he, uh, why he has what I view as some blind spots, um, particularly about the court's ethics, uh, but he does, in my view. They're not, he thinks I'm, I'm just nitpicking. And I, so that's, I guess, as close as I can come to explaining how this very distinguished justice, who's written really a very interesting book that's worth reading, though it's not easy at all, at all times. Skip the statutory stuff. Go to the constitutional law stuff. Um, and at the end, he ha has, is somewhat direct about his genuine concerns about the court today and, its, and the doctrine of originalism um, and textualism. And he's quite direct about it in the book, but he is less direct about it speaking to the public at large, I think. Yeah, I had no better luck when he was sitting in that chair and I tried three times, <laughs> it didn't work. Um, to help us understand though, from your perspective, the fault lines that we're seeing within the court around those who do seem really concerned about, if you'll pardon the expression, the state of the brand, uh, and those for whom the questions of legitimacy and public approval seem not to weigh as heavily? Well, I think that it's very hard to draw those lines distinctly. I mean, because the court, there are three members of the court who are just beginning their careers on the Supreme Court. And at least one of them was only a judge for a little over a year before she ascended to the Supreme Court. And I think it's very hard to determine, to distinguish between those newer justices and what's going to happen with them. And they're all relatively young. And, and the, uh, some of the other members of the court who are, who've been there a long time know what they think are, are, are not going to change, no way, no how. And there are at least two of those, Justice Thomas and Justice Alito, who were pretty predictable, I would say. Um, I was very interested to see the latest sort of data that was compiled, which actually showed that in recent years, Justice Alito has been the most conservative member of the court, not as we all think, Justice Thomas. Um, and I do think that's because Alito's views have changed over time. They've changed to the right. Um, sometimes people change more to the left. Sometimes they change about certain issues. But I think it's just very hard to know where all of these new justices are going to go. And um, one of them, Justice Gorsuch, has a very uh, established view of originalism and textualism that he doesn't veer from, and very established views on, for example, Native Americans, which are very different from any other members of the court. He is the only member of the court who sticks up for the plight of Native Americans, and he is the only member of the court who knows an enormous amount about the history of Native Americans on the court. And he's also far more sympathetic to criminal defendants than most of the other members of the court. Um, still, 
for the most part, he is a he has very doctrinaire views that he has um, come to over a lifetime, and I don't expect those to change. Whether Justice Barrett's will change somewhat, or Justice Kavanaugh's will at all, I really have no idea. I think hers are more likely to than Justice Barrett, than Justice Kavanaugh's, only because he was on the DC circuit for 12 years. And that, you know, that really, in, in all the regulatory stuff anyway, that puts you, if, if after 12 years you don't know what you're in our, your heart of hearts think, um, you probably ought not be on the Supreme Court. <laughs> but he, you know, so he's had a, a longer trail, as it were, a longer path that has, it'd be like saying to me, do you have views about certain journalistic things? Yes, I have those views, and they're very unlikely to change. Um, and some of my young colleagues think probably that I'm a stick in the mud, that I think that you ought not be posting on Twitter what you privately think about political things. I feel, feel that very, very strongly, and I bloody well am not gonna change. And there are people who really very strongly disagree with me. They may change their minds over time because they're young. <laughs> I'm not changing. <laughs> Well, since, since we are actually celebrating um, a kind of reporting, of investigative reporting that serves the public interest tonight, um, you have been reporting on that institution where the people who are talking don't necessarily know and the people who know aren't necessarily talking. And <laughs> the degree of difficulty for the kind of reporting you did through the years seems especially extraordinary. What what? does that require a view of the reporter as you? Well, it really does, I think, require that you, to some extent, you have to just sort of understand that your job is to understand what the issues are, to explain them in a way that pe that's accessible, and that allows people to see that there really are two sides to a great many of these issues two really good sides, I mean, the good arguments that can be made. Can be made. Um, I can't tell you the numbers of times that I've sat down with a pile of briefs and I thought I knew what I thought, and I do think that as a political matter, and I'm reading and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking I know this is broadcast, but you know, and I'm thinking to myself, shit, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, damn, they really have a good argument on this. Um, and I have to make sure that their good argument is on NPR because it's not a very good piece if it's just sort of a one-way street. It's kind of boring after a while. You really want, as you know, those tensions between an argument that you may not agree with but is a good argument and a, and a different argument that somebody else doesn't agree with but is a very good argument. So to go back to your hypothetical younger reporter who disagrees with you about Twitter, um, how do you argue with the position that, that about both sidesism or about giving a platform to arguments that, which is you know, still roiling newsrooms even though I feel like we've been plowing this Well, territory. Trumpism has made this harder, God knows, because I really, for most of my journalistic life, never thought that I would end up saying about a president, much less a presidential candidate, um, that the president said without facts or wrongly stated or we never, see, we never use the word lied and I don't like to use the word lied, but the, said things that are pat patently untrue. I mean, you know, you, you, I really didn't think that usually when you caught out a politician up until about, I don't know, 10 years ago, if you caught out a politician um, saying something that was uh, a distortion, to, let's put it kindly, a distortion, um, they didn't keep up with it. They didn't continue it because it was embarrassing. But for many politicians today, 
there does not seem to be, the word shame does not mm, register. And that's very hard to deal with. And as a result, you have a presidential candidate now who continues to say that the mainstream media is a bunch of, of fake news perpetrators. And his audience, to a significant extent, doesn't listen to us or read us because it now believes that we are telling falsehoods, not facts. And on the other side, there are people who believe that there's, there are alternative facts, whatever that's supposed to mean. You um, didn't set out to become certainly the, the great Supreme Court reporter <laughs> of the generation or even, even the legal space generally. Tell us how that path from starting out here in Boston, we have, of course, a lot of leaders of Boston media here who- if My first job was for the old record. I worked on the women's page, and it was not the women's page of today. When you said um, that a lot of women of my generation had paved the way for, for, because we had had to put up with nonsense, the, the great benefit of being young when we were young and having no women, other women in the newsroom by and large, was that we didn't really understand that it was nonsense. We just knew it was unacceptable. <laughs> so we just plowed on. I'm not sure that I ever really thought uh, that this is terribly unfair. I just thought, I can't, I can't stop. I can't be bothered by these men, because they always were men. I just need to do this. And I need to be very ambitious and never be as much as possible, don't make mistakes, and do what I had to do. But I, you know, I, 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 over my life, I've covered a, a lot of things. I've covered politics, I've covered Congress, and sometimes even occasionally the White House, um, not as a beat, but as a, just going in there as a, uh, as a sub for, you know, a, a week or two. And, and I, you know, I've covered almost everything except I really never covered foreign, foreign affairs. And I could always do lots of different things. At the same time, I covered the Supreme Court. And you can't do that anymore today. Um, you know, when I, the, my, when I joined NPR, this was my beat. I did cover politics somewhat, but I, also, I covered the Supreme Court the Justice Department, all of the investigative congressional hearings, the scandals that would come up, um, and, uh, and the House and Senate Judiciary Committees, and by the way, the intelligence community. Now that's just sort of an, an insane idea today in the world that we live in with the kind of 24 seven news and podcasts and um, digital in terms of, you know, when I joined NPR, there was one radio program, an hour and a half every night. Now there are, we have usually three major news programs a day, including the one that comes out of Boston, uh, here and now. And, um, and we contribute to all, the reporters contribute to all of them. We have podcasts, we have digital. I never used to have to do pre-writes of anything I was going to write. Now, at, toward the end of the court term, I write as many as five or six versions of, of how a Supreme Court case is going to turn out with just holes for quotes because digital wants it fast. And that's the only way I can do that. And I spend an inordinate amount of time on that. I spend several weeks doing that. It, it's a stupid waste of my time, frankly, but <laughs> it is what it is. You know, you can't just say, oh, I'll put up this story about what the Supreme Court said five hours from now, after I do all things considered. That, it doesn't work that way. So you can't do all of that and do a lot of other things. In fact, I was talking to Steve Engelberg and the, when, just an hour or two ago. And you know, 
young people will often say to me, young reporters even will say to me, well, you people who are, have had, who've been covering the beat at the Supreme Court, you never told us all things of these things that ProPublica is telling us. And you, the inference is you just, haven't, you just didn't want to cross anybody. And that's just not true. If you have a beat like this, which at one point was a fairly stately beat, but which isn't anymore, they can, they can and do give us emergency orders any time of the day or night, multiple times a month. And that just never used to be the case. Um, I'm sure some of you know these statistics, but the emergency docket at the Supreme Court in the Bush and Obama administrations, the George W. Bush and the Obama administrations, there were a total of 16 emergency applications from the government over 16 years, eight in each administration. And in the Trump administration, there was something like 40 some odd. And there's, there are lots in the Biden administration now too, because the emergency docket has emerged as a whole separate thing. So the idea that you could do an in big investigations that take multiple people months, if not years, to, to complete and make sure if you're going to write about the ethics of a Supreme Court justice, you better bloody well get it right. You can't be, you cannot say, well, I can do this quick as a, as a quick and dirty piece. No, you can't. It takes forever and a day and still there'll be blowback. Every time I do something that talks about the discord at the court, for example, I, there's huge blowback from uh, most recently um, two justices, three justices put out, including the chief justice, put out a statement denying, saying they had something in a story of mine was not true. However, I hadn't said that. It, it was, it was it, even, the, even, <laughs> even the Washington Post story said, den denying something she hadn't I said, said right? right? So, and that's just some, one paragraph, one paragraph. So it's a very different world today for a beat reporter and especially a Supreme Court reporter. And while I often did, as I said, lots of other things and enjoyed doing them, it's just not an option anymore. Do you see a path we keep hearing now in light of, well, not least ProPublica's reporting, um, more and more versions of reforms from sort of the mild ethics rules versions to expanding the court or term limits or all of these. Is this wish casting? Is this a fantasy? Is there, what, what is the path to restoring faith and trust in the institution look like? I, I'm not sure I know. I mean, it still is the institution that has better approval ratings than uh, the, the executive branch or Congress by a long shot. Um, and certainly than we do as journalists when you ask people what they think of us. Um, but I don't think there's an easy answer to that and, or one that is likely to happen. So, you know, I, I, it's, it's pretty clear that term limits or other alternatives to the current way of picking the court or keeping, uh, the, keeping the idea that people serve until, you know, that there is no, there is no limit to their terms or there is no that we we they're nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate and that we don't have a filibuster anymore, so that doesn't make it the, the edging to the center, which might be slight, uh, uh, but still significant. Um, that's gone, the filibuster's gone. Um, and if you think about it, you just remember that most of these things, these proposals would require a constitutional amendment, which requires two thirds of the House and Senate and three quarters of the states to approve. 
Now, if you believe that that is possible, I have a bridge in Baltimore I'd like to sell. <laughs> So I, th I think it's very hard to come up with a, um, an institutional change as opposed to the notion that some of the members of the court will see that um, if they lose their credibility increasingly, um, they, they will, nobody will pay attention to them and it will become a kind of a, a wildfire. January 6th was a, was a wildfire for democ democracy. And the court hasn't seen that for itself yet, but it could. And I think Justice Breyer accurately warns about that. You um, had wrote so movingly about your long friendship with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and, I, and I've wondered as you hear now people saying that, oh, Sonia Sotomayor needs to resign immediately mm. and, and criticize Justice Ginsburg for the decision she made, how that must sit with you? Well, you know, I, Justice Sotomayor isn't even 70 yet, I don't think. Right. And so I think that she's actually quite young. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 she's been on the court since uh, 2009 or 10, I can't even remember anymore. And that's actually, you know, th that's a reasonable period of time, but uh, it, Justice Ginsburg, there's no doubt in my mind that if she knew that she was going to get sick again, that she would have retired. Uh, she did her damnedest to, to live as long as she possibly could and did things uh, I am confident and suffered significantly, I am confident, in a manner that she would not have if she uh, weren't trying to make it past the election. Justice Sotomayor, this is a whole different kettle of fish. I mean, she'll, she's a very smart woman and she will pick her time. And I don't know what that time will be, but you, you can't, it, first of all, it takes a while to, Justice Breyer says, between three and five years, uh, when quoting other colleagues, of how long it takes you to get, even if you've been like he was, not only, he'd been a judge for a very long time and be, had become chief judge of the First Circuit. He was used to being a judge and it still took him he said somewhere between three and five years to feel sort of confident in his position as a Supreme Court justice. And I, you know, you can't, this, these are not jobs you really want to shuffle people through every five, six, seven, or even 10 years. Um, yes, it's true that in earlier times, people left the court often for other political jobs, um, but, uh, other people were on the court for, you know, Chief Justice Marshall, who was probably the most famous and revered member of the court in the court's history. I don't actually remember how many years he was on the court, but it was in like 30. Uh, these are not jobs to have for a short time. Uh, far be it for me to tell you what the right time would be, but it's not a it's not a short time. And you hope that people will get, over time, some wisdom in addition to some fire in their bellies. I'm going to invite um, people who would like to ask a question. We have microphones. Um, while I ask you, when, when you encounter young journalists who want to grow up to be just like Nina Totenberg, <laughs> what advice do you give them? Pick your battles. <laughs> That's the first thing I tell them. And they think I'm crazy because they think you ought to have battles over everything. But you really do, I think, in life have to learn to pick your battles. It's even true in marriage, for God's sakes. You pick your battles in life. And you just learn over time to fight over the things that are really important to you. So those, that's my first thing. 
The second thing I tell them is that they're going to have to make a living and that that's harder these days. It really is. I, I'm very lucky that I came up at a time, you know, when I, when I went to work at NPR, I made just unbelievably little money. When I met my sweet husband and told him I made, and I was in my 50s, and I told him I was making $55,000 a year, and I by, was already moderately famous. He just couldn't believe it. Now, that, thank God, is no longer true at NPR. People make a livable wage. But there are so few journalistic institutions that can pay um, a, a real living wage for real journalism, not a one minute or 50 second wonder on the local TV about who got, just got shot. Um, again, and I think that's the hardest th thing that I have to tell them is that this is the most wonderful job in the world to have. Um, I was out for two and a half months after this back operation, including a month in rehab. And when I got back to work, I was so happy. It is the most interesting way to spend your life. It is a gift, and um, I agree with people who say I can't believe they pay me for doing this, except that I do want to have a decent life, so I don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the things I, I tell young journalists, because you do have to make a living. Hello, and um, Nina, you may not remember me. I was one of the members of the Supreme Court press pool freelancer who you stepped over as you go past to go to the front rows. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the questions that I've had, and my name is Gloria Brown Marshall, and one of the questions that I have is, um, we are learning more because of ProPublica about um, Clarence Thomas and Alito and these trips. Should we have known more about their personal lives in the beginning? I mean, that's, that's not their personal life. Well, the reason why it comes out as part of their personal lives, and I'm asking this question because we know about the personal lives of presidents and we know some personal lives of people in Congress, but it seemed like uh, for many years, the personal life of Supreme Court justices was behind a curtain and it was, they were seen almost as robots and these objective people. But um, this idea of the personal life of the Supreme Court justice being part of things that regular people should know about. I'm just wondering, should we now spend more time trying to find out what they're doing when they're not on the court? Well, fortunately, there are reporters who are assigned to that at a couple of large newspapers. And, there are, and ProPublica has really, I think, done the best job of anybody. And one of the things I think you always have to worry about, there are two things to worry about is, there are stories that are really great stories. And there are stories that reek of, I just spent three months on this, and, and I, it, has, it has to go in the newspaper. <laughs> and I'm, and I, it's my beat, so I'm looking, and I'm, go, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and the there isn't quite there. That's not to say it isn't somewhere, but you didn't find it. And I, you know, you have to be careful about those stories as well as being proud of the wonderful stories that are really revelatory. But I don't, you know, I think ethics questions are not a question of a personal life. Personal life is, are you getting divorced? Did you cheat on your, on your I don't really care if a Supreme Court justice cheats on his or her wife or, or husband. That, has, you know, you, could, you can make the argument that it has to do with the character of a politician you do or don't want to vote for. But over the course of history, I'm confident, in fact, I know historically of, even in relatively modern history, of affairs that were had and, you know, marriages that broke up and nobody cares about that. They care about and should care about and we should care about 
ethical questions, conflicts of interest, violations of the spirit of ethics rules. Yes, the ethics rules aren't binding on the Supreme Court, um, and there, is, there are a couple of minorly good reasons for that about certain things. But for the most part, those ethics rules should apply not only to lower court judges, but to Supreme Court justices. And there isn't, a, I have to say that there is, as a profession, and we can't do this really well as an, as, as a, an, at NPR or any other national news organization. This really is for local news organizations. And they're disappearing, but it's their job to see that federal and local judges li live up to the standards of ethics that they're supposed to, and that they frequently do not live up to. I mean, it, Fix the Court has done a very good job of monitoring what um, lower court judges do. And, and as much as a sort of one-man band can do that, um, Fix the Court has done that. But it, there are, I'm confident, at least 100 great stories about ethical oversights, let's be charitable, by federal judges at, lower, at the lower court level, and they're not covered by anybody. Um, just in, in closing, I have to note again that one thing that was wonderful and inspiring about our 170 entries for the investigative reporting prize for our finalists is that it represented the work of tiny little newsrooms and great big ones. And, and that work that is hard and expensive and time consuming um, continues and flourishes even against enormous odds. Having said that, we are reading this year even more than normal about the challenges facing our industry. And I'd, I'd love to hear you talk a little about where you see public media fitting in, where the role of philanthropy needs to fit in, or how we put the pieces together to make this work not only possible, but really able to flourish. You've asked me a lot of questions tonight to which I really don't have answers. <laughs> <laughs> And if the answers were simple, somebody else would have had them. Um, it's, you know, for a while people looked at the NPR model as something to emulate, and, I'm, and it is something to emulate, but we, we are struggling just like everybody else. I mean, people, to a significant extent, when they were home during COVID, uh, stopped listening to the radio because they were, had a million children crawling around. They didn't have time. They weren't in their cars. They weren't quietly cooking a meal, which is another time people listen to the radio. And so we've come back, but we still have, uh, I, you know, I, I love radio, so I hope it comes back to flourish as, as it always did. But one of the reasons I make sure to do everything else, including tweet, um, <laughs> is that I don't want to be counted out because there's all this new stuff happening all the time. I haven't actually tackled TikTok yet, but I will. I will. I promise you I will. I don't want to cede any territory. I want to make sure that wherever listeners or viewers or readers are who are interested in the news at all, we can reach them. And we have to be very, I think, unprideful about it and just work. It's the only way I know is to just work. Um, and there isn't a model that will work for everybody. One hopes that philanthropy will help, that somebody will have a great idea like Tiny Desk Concert that brings young people, for example, to NPR through music and then gets them interested in other things. Um, but it's very, 
it's a daunting task. I agree, it's a daunting task, but I'm, we won't, you can't have a thriving democracy or a thriving country if you don't have not just a free press, but an active press, one that gets paid attention to. And, I, you know, I'm like everybody else. I have my moments where I turn off the radio because the piece is too disturbing. And I don't quite know how to fix that except to make sure that the mix is good enough that you keep people coming back over and over again because they heard something wonderful and funny and disturbing. All of those things. And they're not prepared to give up on us so that we, we can't give up on them. Well, and Nina, you said it about reaching readers where they are, and there is no one who has reached <laughs> listeners, viewers, readers, audiences um, in quite the way you have. And it is an honor to celebrate such an extraordinary oh, career. This is the best thing. Thank you so much. This and, is really a wonderful honor. Thank you all.